Welcome to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County Cyber Webinar. My name is Sarah Gardangi. There is a growing need in the Maryland area for government and corporate entities to provide security services. The UMBC Graduate Cybersecurity Program meets this demand. Today you will hear first-hand program information pertaining to cybersecurity topics and how individuals pursuing a master's degree in cybersecurity also gain critical knowledge in program management, leadership, and communication. The webinar will also focus on the upcoming Maryland Cyber Challenge and Conference, MDC3, that will be held in Baltimore this fall. You will learn details of the challenge and how you can participate in the event. Here to present today is Dr. Rick Forno, UMBC's Graduate Program Director and MDC3 Co-Chair of the Steering Committee. He brings a wealth of research interests and professional expertise, including information age conflict, critical infrastructure protection, cybersecurity operations, especially incident handling, and the social shaping of technology. Again, should you have any technical problems during the webinar, please contact 1-800-263-6317. To ask a question during the webinar, please use the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. We do anticipate many questions during the presentation. If we are not able to answer your question, please email us after the presentation at nancyc at umbc.edu. This webinar is being recorded today. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Rick Forno. Hello everyone. Hope everybody is keeping cool in this lovely June heat we're having here in the uh, National Capital Region. My name is Rick Forno and I am going to be presenting to you about the UMBC Cybersecurity Program and in particular um, and then followed by the MDC3 competition. A little bit about UMBC before we get started. UMBC is an honors university in Maryland, which means that we are a um, we are research focused, and that's important because you know that adds a different dimension to the um, experience that our students have here. We are located between Baltimore and Washington D.C. Although I would say we are much closer to Baltimore than D.C., but it's fairly convenient to both um, both metropolises. Part of UMBC, again, being a research University is our, our research centers, and we have two that are focused on cybersecurity. Firstly, within the Department of Computer Science, we have the Center for Information Security and Assurance, or CISA, and that conducts uh, assorted research activities in cybersecurity topics uh, ranging from computer forensics to secure electronic voting to smart grid security and so forth. Um, also, UMBC hosts through the, the UMBC Training Centers, the Center for Cybersecurity Training. And this organization provides technical, professional, hands-on training in various cybersecurity activities, things like the CISSP, CEH certification, and so forth. One thing that we are very proud of is that UMBC is one of the few universities in the country that has both, has been recognized both as a center for academic excellence and a Center for Academic Excellence in Research by the NSA and Homeland Security. It's interesting because this designation allows us to, or highlights that UMBC does some cutting edge research in the information insurance area that is of interest to the government and um, obviously and, and the private sector. UMBC for two years in a row has been ranked by US News and World Report as the number one up and coming university in the country. And that's that's significant because at UMBC uh, being up and coming is not a, a, a bad thing. In fact, we view it as an opportunity. Being up and coming means we can pick our opportunities and then go after them with everything we can muster as a university to do something and do it well. So we're agile and we are nimble again and, we, and US News picked up on that. 
we are well known for our work and our um, graduates from science and engineering programs and also those in professional studies for the working, um, the working adults. So in terms of cybersecurity at UMBC, who's it for? Well, the answer is pretty much anyone. Whether you are a cybersecurity professional already, you're involved in IT more broadly but are interested in cybersecurity, or you're looking to make a possible career change, or you are encountering cybersecurity issues at your organization, we can help. Our program is designed for a wide range of um, audiences and backgrounds and experiences. We have students right now that work for the U.S. military, work for the private sector. Some are fresh out of their undergraduate studies and wish to continue in the cybersecurity field. We have a wide range of expertise uh, in our program already, and that just, to me, tells tells me that we are attracting the right caliber of people because we're, we're covering the whole spectrum of cybersecurity practitioners and IT specialists who are interested in the subject matter. Our first major offering is the MPS in cybersecurity. The MPS is a Master's in Professional Studies. The MPS in cybersecurity at UMBC is can be broken down into two broad categories required courses, our core courses, and then electives. Now as you look at the required courses in that first section of, this, of the slide, you see six core cybersecurity courses. These are required. And what you may find interesting is that there are both cybersecurity courses and more broadly speaking, generic management courses. And this is important because the people that we have consulted uh, from the local workforce who hire our graduates have told us that while technical and discipline specific skills and insight in cybersecurity is important, what's equally important is a student's ability to work well as a team, communicate their findings, and grow beyond their current position. All too often in my 15 years in the industry, I've seen executives and engineers talking across each other. Neither side knows how the, what the other expects or how they operate. So the way our program is designed, it gives students the exposure to both the engineering and the executive perspectives so that when they graduate, the student is better prepared to work as part of a team and ascend through their uh, their professional development in a meaningful manner. That's why we have several management courses as required courses in the cybersecurity program. But outside of the required courses, we then allow the students to choose three electives. And these generally are related to cybersecurity, a few of which are listed on the slide here. Students that are looking at more uh, policy or management oriented electives may pursue courses on cyber warfare or global cyber capabilities and trends. Those are more analytical, more policy oriented. So if you're an intelligence analyst, for example, that might be something of interest. By the same token, if you are a more technical person, you might consider courses on network security, computer forensics, uh, data visualization, and so forth that are much more technical and hands-on in, uh, in their scope. So when you put it all together, the MPS program give students a solid foundation in cybersecurity principles and procedures, management procedures, the soft skills that the employers are looking for, and that allows them to specialize in their respective area of cybersecurity, either technical or non-technical as appropriate. By comparison, the UMBC Graduate Certificate in Cybersecurity Strategy and Policy is a subset of the master's degree. And as you can see, it is a four-course certificate, 12 credits, and all four of these courses also apply to the master's. So for example, if you enrolled as a certificate student and took these four courses, you complete them successfully, you would get your certificate. But then if you decide to pursue your master's, at this point, you're about halfway done since all four of these courses transfer into the MPS program. So the choice is up to you if you want to enroll as a master's student directly or if you want to start off with a cybersecurity graduate certificate. We have students that have applied in the uh, graduate certificate program who have come up to me and, and asked, can I transfer into the master's program because they like what they're seeing thus far. 
So the choice really is up to you. So why come to UMBC? Well, there are a lot of reasons. One of the key, um, the, the key uh, challenges for me is to ensure that the courses we, we offer are relevant and meaningful. And a large part of that comes down to not just the syllabus and the material covered, but the quality of the person giving the course. That's why I take great effort to ensure that our instructors are real-world practitioners who do this stuff on a daily basis and can apply and incorporate what they're working on in the real world to the classroom. And that is um, a great benefit to the students. They, uh, they appreciate and they see the significance of what they're studying in the class, knowing it has real-world ramifications. Courses at UMBC in the cybersecurity program are fairly flexible in their scheduling. Most of our courses are seminar-based in person, although we have some that are offered in a hybrid mode, which might entail one class meeting for, uh, every other week or every two weeks or every month as appropriate. The idea is that we want to give students the flexibility to schedule their courses around their professional and personal lives. All of our courses in the cybersecurity program are offered in the late afternoon and evening, Monday through Thursday. So um, the first courses that we offer begin at 4.30 p.m. Uh, we realize that that is a, a doable time for many professionals who can leave work a little early. The courses are two and a half hours in length and meet once a week. Once a week is, again, something that is conducive to the working professional. UMBC in general as a university has strong partnerships with many of our local employers, both government and private sector. Within the cybersecurity program, the large companies whose representatives sit on our advisory board are very interested in seeing how our cybersecurity students do, and they want first crack at possibly uh, looking at them for job opportunities or internships. So we maintain these strong relationships with local hiring organizations, local employers, and the students have the exposure to career possibilities in cybersecurity and cyber operations. And finally, as a research university, UMBC does more than just teach classes. The cybersecurity program here offers you know, other activities to allow students who choose to get more engaged in the discipline to become more engaged in the discipline whether that's through research and publishing, attending conferences, participating in the UMBC cyber defense team, or so forth. We want to give the students in our program as much opportunity to explore and succeed in cybersecurity as they can while they're here. We do care about the whole student, the whole person, the whole professional. So you come to UMBC, you have a wide, a large number of doors that are open for you, and it's up to you to decide which ones you, uh, you want to go through and see what's behind it. In terms of the future, we are looking to expand our course offerings in several interesting areas going forward. We will likely offer additional graduate certificate programs in the, uh, in, in the uh, coming years. As a university, we're always looking for grant funding and partnerships with local uh, organizations to find areas of interest for students and local, um, local employers alike. And of course, we work very closely and we're very actively engaged with federal, state, and local cybersecurity initiatives. And where possible, we try to leverage our participation in those various ventures into our program, again, to bring a more robust experience to our students. For those of you who are interested in applying, please visit our website, but this gives you some uh, basic information. You will need official college transcripts, a completed application, and a goal statement. I would recommend a goal statement for students who are interested in our program but whose academic background may not suggest that they are uh, IT or have a strong enough IT background. So goal statements are required. and if you want to use that as a justification letter, if you want to use that as a uh, way to say, although I have an, ec an economics background, the past nine years I've been involved in IT in various levels, that gives me some more context to evaluate your application and realize that although you have a liberal arts academic background, your work experience makes up for that. So I, so I encourage you to uh, 
be as uh, candid as possible in your goal statement. Letters of recommendation are helpful, but they are not required. And by the same token, test scores, such as the GRE, are not required either. For more information about this, please contact uh, Nancy Clemens. She is, will be your point of contact for admissions to the uh, cybersecurity program and can answer specific questions about that process. If you are enrolled at another university at the graduate level or you've taken other graduate level cybersecurity courses, we may be able to accept them here uh, as transfer credit. Once you apply and are accepted, uh, I would ask if you have courses that you think you would want to transfer, contact me as the program director. You know, describe the course. If you have a copy of the syllabus, that's helpful in evaluate, evaluating the course and the number of credit hours. And we'll see how that fits into our program and where we can accept that those credits for. Again, Nancy Clements is the point of contact for admissions into the cybersecurity program. Her email address is nancyc at umbc.edu, or if you want to call her, she is at 410-455-5536. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. All right, Rick, quite a few questions have been coming in. Uh, one of the questions uh, was from someone who was interested in your um, your part of the presentation that talked about organizations and businesses in the area, and they would like to know who are some of the local organizations who want to hire the graduating seniors or students from the program, uh, as well as where uh, do some of the students currently work who are in the program? Okay, that's a uh, that's a pretty big question, but I'll try to give it a pretty big answer. Many of our um, our students are uh, they, they work in the local area. Uh, some of the employers can include uh, the U.S. government. You think of uh, the National Security Agency or DISA or Cyber Command. You have pro uh, Social Security Administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, in Baltimore. You have private sector companies as well, many of which are government contractors like Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin. That's where many of our students currently are employed in these types of companies, and that's also um, those are the same companies that are looking to hire our graduates once they succeed through our program. Great. And another question that has come up is if a person needs to have security clearance in order to get that first job coming out of the program. That's actually a very common question. Um, you do not need a security clearance to go through our program. You do not need to be a U.S. citizen to take our program. All of our courses are publicly available. They are unclassified. That being said, if you are looking to be employed by a company or a government agency that requires a security clearance, then yes, you would have to go through a security clearance process, but that would be done by the government or the company in question. That would not be done uh, through the university. Okay. And a couple other questions that were related uh, were about the working professional and how can this program uh, work with that type of full-time work schedule? Well, this would be done, obviously, uh, after hours in many cases, unless your employer would give you the time to take time off to take these classes. Uh, it really it comes down to time management and how able you are to uh, fit classes into your schedule. I mean, how you're able to do that or if you're able to do that, that's up to the individual student to determine. Uh, for example, the, the NSA, they have a program called 2020, where they will allow their employees to work for 20 hours a week and then spend 20 hours a week in, in classes for a degree. That's helpful. Not, not, not many companies or organizations do that. So the question of how much time you can devote to your studies really depends on your schedule and if you can get some support in your scheduling from your employer. And Rick, can you explain a little further about when the classes are held? Sure. Our classes are held Monday through Thursday. The first class, the first slot is at 4.30 p.m. Then our second slot, I believe, is at 6.10. And then our third slot is an hour later. So the earliest that we run our classes is at 4.30. 
Okay. But we try to vary the, t the start times of the sections so that if you can't make a 4.30 class, but you make a 6 o'clock class, you have that opportunity as well during the year. Great. And another question that's just come in is if there are any financial related courses available in the program. Yes, there are some financial courses that you would uh, be able to take as, uh, as part of the program. They are not within the cybersecurity program specifically, but if you are interested in taking some cyber some financial courses uh, as part of your, your degree here, I'd be happy to work with you to identify courses that are relevant for you. Great. Okay, then. I think that we're ready to move on to the next part of the presentation. Okay, great. Well, it's um, I'm back. And what I would like to do now is move on and discuss the reason why I'm, I'm sure many of you are here, the MDC3, the Maryland Cyber Challenge and Conference. This is the inaugural year for, the, for MDC3. It is a joint venture between UMBC, SAIC, the National Cybersecurity Alliance, the Tech Council of Maryland, and the Governor's Office through, through the Maryland, the Cyber Maryland Initiative um, run by uh, Governor O'Malley's office. The five of us have come together to, you know, to really uh, champion the fact that Maryland has become the epicenter for cybersecurity and all things cyber. We have the NSA, DISA is coming to Fort Meade, Cyber Command is at Fort Meade, there's NIST, there's NIH, a very technical oriented organization. A lot of companies are in Maryland that focus on cyber and IT related uh, projects. So Maryland truly is the place to be if you're interested in cybersecurity. And all of us came together last fall and decided that, well, let's really, you know, raise the level of awareness about Maryland as a cybersecurity center of excellence. And thus, MDC3 was born. So the second part of this, uh, this webinar is going to talk about MDC3, give you an overview about the event, uh, why you would want to consider joining up and playing. And then again, we'll have time at the end for some questions if you have any. So why MDC3? Well, there are a couple of key reasons. First and foremost, we want to allow participants to explore and discover the world of cybersecurity and cyber operations. It's a booming career field. It's a booming educational field. There's a lot of opportunities out there. So this gives people, students, the public, professionals, an opportunity to explore this vast career field. We also want to encourage participants in the challenge towards careers and educational pursuits in cybersecurity and consider cybersecurity as a valid and meaningful professional you know, course, a professional, uh, professional undertaking. Along the way, we want to teach students, teach participants about cybersecurity skills, maybe brush up on your skills if you're a little rusty, learn some new techniques. Or if you're just starting out and you're just curious about cybersecurity, you'll learn some, some best practices and learn what's important about to keep in mind as a citizen in this wired information age. For students and teams that are competing in the actual cyber challenge, the MDC3 will enhance the team's ability to work together, collaborate, and share, um, share activities, delegate tasks, and improve their critical thinking, all of which are essential if you are going to be a cybersecurity practitioner in the real world. Teams that win at both the student and professional levels will be enriched in the form of meaningful scholarships and or cash prizes. I can't say how much these will be, but I do want to stress these are meaningful prizes. So you're not competing in the challenge to get a t-shirt. You're, co you're competing to learn, to uh, improve your skills, get some more exposure to the industry and to the uh, profession, and if you emerge victorious, uh, we will very you will be helped in your way in pursuing cybersecurity studies. And then finally, we want you to have fun and enjoy. I mean, this is an intellectual event, but it's one that has become in many parts of the country a varsity sport. It's an inter cyber defense and cyber challenges are a regional or national competition. So you, you want to compete, but you also want to have fun. And part of having fun is not setting the bar so high to, uh, to enlist and, and play that few people can actually participate. 
That's why for the MDC-3, our requirements for contestants are pretty basic. You need to have a basic understanding of Windows, Unix, and how the Internet works. You don't need to be a cyber wizard or a super programmer or the best hacker in Maryland, but you need to know how computers work, how Windows is set up, what, you know, how, to, how to configure Windows to some degree. So you need those basic skills. You need to have a willingness to, to learn and work together as a team. This is a team effort. And again, a desire to have fun. MDC3 is ongoing during the course of 2011. And I'm going to work this uh, timeline from the bottom of the slide up. In November, there will be a formal awards dinner hosted at UMBC for the top three teams in each division high school, collegiate, and professional. There will be more details on the date and uh, all that stuff later on. The finals of the MDC3 competition will occur October 21st and 22nd at the Baltimore Convention Center. At, during these days, the challenge will be going on while at the same time the Maryland Cyber Conference will be occurring. And this is two days of technical and non-technical uh, seminars and tracks uh, to be the major cybersecurity conference for Maryland. We'll talk about the conference more in a little bit. Over the, during the latter part of the summer, there will be a series of qualification rounds for high school, collegiate, and professional teams. And as you can see on the slides, these are occurring over a weekend, pretty much from 5 p.m. Friday through 9 p.m. on Sunday. Now, during these qualification rounds, teams will have a window of opportunity. So at some point over that weekend, a team will have a six-hour block of time where they will log in and conduct their qualification activities. You can't break the time out between Saturday and Sunday. It's six hours contiguous time. So it's, you know, you log on and you're there for six hours. Similarly, over the summer, we will have a series of unscored practice rounds that will allow participants to get a feel for the cyber challenge environment, the technology used, and how the, uh, how the challenge will unfold so that when the qualification rounds do count and score is being kept, they will at least know the environment and the, and the software that they're using. As I said, the MDC3 conference will be held in Baltimore on October 21st and 22nd. It will be running at the same time as the Cyber Challenge finals. People attending the conference will be able to monitor and track the challenge events that are going on in the, in the other room. We will provide updates throughout the conference as to what teams are um, winning and uh, placing and how people are scoring. The conference itself will be two days of technical and non-technical events, but interestingly, we're not going to be your average DC area conference. We are not catering this conference to the government or the intelligence community. We are making this a broad-based conference that will appeal to a wide range of people, both from the government, military, the private sector, academia, uh, large businesses, small businesses, and the and the so it's going to be different from many other uh, cybersecurity conferences in the DC area. Along with the conference and the Cyber Challenge finals, there will be an exhibitor fair and many opportunities for attendees to mingle with their colleagues, meet local employers, uh, see some new technology that's being demoed, and so forth. It's going to be a uh, fun event. It is going to be uh, dynamic. We've got some very interesting speakers lined up that will be posted shortly. And I would encourage you to visit the conference website, mdc3.org, to find the ongoing draft of the agenda. We will be announcing speakers in the coming weeks. And uh, I encourage you to just bookmark the site and check, check back on that. In terms of the, of the cyber challenge itself, the idea is that we want to provide an, op an environment where participants and teams can train as they expect to operate. And on this slide, you can see a list of several key skills that every cybersecurity or cyber operator needs to uh, deal with whether it's maintaining critical services, patching systems, identifying vulnerabilities or suspicious activity, responding to attacks, uh, rebuilding systems, 
reporting attacks, conducting forensic, forensic analysis, and then communicating and working as a team. These are all attributes that employers want in their cyber teams. And this is the same set of skills that we are facilitating here at the, at the Cyber Challenge. Again, we want to realistically train as we expect to realistically operate. The software in question that's going to be used at the, um, for the Maryland Cyber Challenge is from SAIC and it's called CyberNexus. For the purposes of the Maryland Cyber Challenge, we're going to focus on three key events, if you will. We'll be, we'll be uh, doing a defensive engagement where blue teams, which are the individual teams that are competing, will be defending their networks against live attacks by a qualified red team the adversary, the hackers, and they will be graded on how well they secure and keep critical services up and running, protecting their hosts, communicating findings, and so forth. It's a purely defensive operation. There will be a forensics aspect, a forensics task, where you will, the participants will be trying to identify what happened, collecting clues, doing analysis of logs, network traffic and seeing what's happening on the network. And then finally, we will be doing what we call capture the flag. And this is a combination of attack and defense. And it's probably the, uh, the most fun of the three events because not only are you defending your network, but you are also trying to compromise the red team's network or another network compromise one of their systems, or many of their systems, and then defend those systems from other teams trying to compromise those systems. So it's really a dynamic, fast-paced fast, fast -paced environment because you're, doing, you're defending your own systems while at the same time trying to conquer other systems. Capture the Flag is a uh, simulation game that is done quite frequently at DEF CON and at other cybersecurity conferences and, and, and events. It's a lot of fun. All the teams for the uh, Maryland Cyber Challenge may have up to six players, but when you register to compete, you don't have to have all six players identified. You can register your team and fill in the, uh, fill in the names later, but teams may have up to six players. Now I'll talk a little bit about how the, uh, how the game is set up from an ar architectural perspective. The final game will be done, as I mentioned, in Baltimore on uh, the 21st and 22nd of October. In this case, the idea is that the red team will be attacking and all the competitors will be defending and doing whatever they need to do in response. Very manpower intensive. Um, the software in question, you will have images of various computers will be downloaded and you will have to defend them in this live, live fire environment, if you will. The actual scoring is done remotely, I'll talk about scoring in a little bit, but it's a, a distributed game in the sense that while you are in Baltimore at the finals in person, the actual activity is, is occurring through a VPN th to our data center where CyberNexus is, is located. By comparison, the qualifying and practice rounds are what we call a distributed game, and in this case, the contestants will simply download a virtual image from SAIC at the appropriate time, mount the image, and then proceed to conduct their defensive and configuration activities on that vulnerable system. And they'll be scored on how many vulnerabilities they find, how quickly they do things, what they notice, what they report, and so forth. The big key difference is that the distributed game and the qualifying rounds doesn't focus too much on the teamwork aspect so that there, there's no trouble ticket system in place during the qualifying rounds. During the finals, yes, there is a trouble ticketing system, so if you notice some suspicious activity, you log it into the trouble ticket system, and a member of the refereeing team will look at the trouble ticket, and you will get points added or deducted as appropriate based on what you've reported. Full information about the qualifying rounds, the technical requirements for the teams for the qualifying and the final rounds is available in the contestant packets on the challenge website, mdc3.org. Okay, what you're looking at here are a couple of displays of the CyberNexus environment. 
Many of these you will not see. This is what the judges will see and mission control for the cyber challenge will see. But I wanted to give you a feel for what, you, what they're looking at in terms of the, the environment. You can see a, uh, up front in the lower, the lower image uh, here a, a, a spaghetti graph. This shows the status of individual systems for a given team. As you can see, the graph shows there are spikes and there are drops and valleys. This is when a machine was compromised. The score goes down. The machine is fixed. The score goes up. But notice the scores don't go straight up. The idea is that you could fix a, you could fix a system early on but that problem may reappear if the patch wasn't successful or the fix wasn't appropriate. So time is a key factor as well. Can you keep that system up and running? You can have a system that's vulnerable all through the exercise and then the last minute of the, of the game fix it and you would think that would shoot your score up to 100%. Well, it wouldn't because you fixed it but very late in the game. So the idea is we try to create this realistic feel that once something is fixed, that's not a guarantee that it's going to stay fixed. Behind the image here on the left, you see a series of um, red and green bars. This is what a judge in the challenge will look at to see what systems and services are running. As you might infer, green means the system is up and running perfectly. Red means the system is down and there's been a problem. Did you detect that? If so, what did you do? And so forth. What you will see as a competitor in CyberNexus is something, according to this chart, where it will be, um, to put it very simply, a network diagram with various servers and network devices that you will then be able to log in through Windows, um, through Windows remote, remote Desktop and configure the various systems on the fly. And you'll have this master status board, so you'll know very quickly which systems or services or servers have a problem that require your attention. And again, there's more information about the CyberNexus system in the competitor packet or at the SAIC website. For the Cyber Challenge, and again, this is a very uh, preliminary sort of a teaser commercial for the challenge, but I hope it kind of whet your appetite. If you are interested in learning more about the competition or the challenge, please feel free to contact either myself or Jessica Gulick at SAIC. If you're interested in CyberNexus, the program itself, if you think it might be something useful for your organization and you want to uh, you know, go about exploring it for you know, institutional use, please contact the program manager for CyberNexus out in San Diego, Duke Ayers. And as always, visit mdc3.org for more information about the conference, about the challenge, and of course, to register. With that, are there any questions about the Maryland Cyber Challenge or Conference. All right, Rick. Quite a few questions have actually come in. And related to MDC3, uh, the question came up, do people need to register in advance or pay to attend the conference? You, yes, you do need to register uh, and sign up for the conference. Um, I believe, I could be wrong. I don't know 100% if we're accepting walk-ins. But I would encourage you, if you think you're going to attend, to you know register in advance and uh, and get on the rosters early. Great. Will there be a job fair at the conference? You mentioned several exhibitors and speakers, but will there be an event like a job fair? There will not be a specific job fair. There will be opportunities uh, to meet with companies again at the various networking receptions or the birds of the feather session. Um, if a company is exhibiting and decides to send along a recruiter or two to man their booths, that's certainly up to them to do, and I would encourage people who are interested in networking if, uh, to bring some resumes. You never know. Okay. And uh, this was a general question. It, it might be related to MDC3 or as well to uh, the graduate program. The question is, are there opportunities to get internships for students who don't have much technical experience? We can certainly work with the students through the UMBC, uh, the Shriver Center, to identify internship opportunities. Um, the Cyber Challenge would be a good way to learn some experience, get some experience firsthand as a, a cybersecurity person. 
but in terms of internships, I would point this person to the, uh, the Shriver Center here at UMBC. Great. Another question that came in asks, as a working college student, are there any limitations as to the college student group for the MDC3? If you are a working college student, or if you're a college student and you're uh, registering as a professional team, if you get your coworkers together, then you would be competing at the collegiate. I'm sorry, at the professional level. So yes, you would have to compete at, as a professional. Okay. And there's somebody who's interested in being a speaker at the conference. Who would they contact if they would like to, to get involved in presenting at the conference? Um, have them send me an email, okay. richard.forno at umbc.edu, and I'll be happy to uh, see what we can do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Rick, for presenting such complete information about the UMBC Graduate Cybersecurity Program and for the information about the MDC3. We really appreciate your attendance at the webinar today. We ask that you complete the survey form because your feedback is very important. We also encourage you to email us if we were unable to answer your question today. We are going to put the questions together with answers and post them uh, when we also post the download, the download of the presentation in about two weeks. Thanks. We look forward to seeing you at UMBC and at the MDC3 in October.